What, Lucius? Ho! Oh. I cannot by the progress of the stars give guess how near to-day. Lucius, I say! I would it were my fault to sleep so soundly. When, Lucius, when? Awake, I say! What, Lucius? Called you, my lord? Get me a taper in my study, Lucius. When it is lighted, come and call me here. I will, my lord. It must be by his death, and for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him. But for the general, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the ardor, and that craves weary walking. Crown him that, and then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power, and to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason, but tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the utmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may, then lest he may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is augmented would run to these and these extremities. And therefore, Think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched, would, as his kind, grow mischievous, and kill him in the shell. The taper burneth in your closet, sir. Searching the window for a flint, I found this paper, thus sealed up, and I am sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Get you to bed again. It is not day. Is not tomorrow, boy, the Ides of March? I know not, sir. Look in the calendar and bring me word. I will, sir. The exaltations whizzing in the air give so much light that I may read by them. Brutus, thou sleep'st, awake, and see thyself. Shall roam and all speak, strike, redress? Brutus, thou sleep'st, awake. Such instigations have been often dropped where I have took them up. Shall roam and all. Thus must I piece it out. Shall Rome stand under one man's awe? What? Rome? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarquin drive when he was called a king. Speak, strike, redress. Am I entreated to speak and strike? O oh, Rome, I make thee promise, if the redress will follow, thou receivest thy full petition at the hand of Brutus. Sir, March was wasted fourteen days. Tis good. Go to the gate, somebody knocks. Since Cassius first did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma, or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instruments are then in council, and the state of man, like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. <laughs> Sir, tis your brother Cassius at the door, who doth desire to see you. Is he alone? No, sir. There are more with him. Do you know them? No, sir. Their hats are plucked about their ears. And half their faces are buried in their cloaks. Uh, but that by no means I may discover them and, and find any mark of favor. Let him enter. They are the faction. Oh, conspiracy. 
Shamest thou to show thy dangerous brow by night, when evils are most free? Oh, then by day, where wilt thou find a cavern dark enough to mask thy monstrous visage? Seek none conspiracy. Hide it in smiles and affability, for if thou path thy native semblance on, no, not Erebus itself were dim enough to hide thee from prevention. I think we are too bold upon your rest. Good morrow, Brutus. Do we trouble you? I have been up this hour awake all night. Know I these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them, and no man here but honors you, and every one doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble Roman bears of you. This is Trebonius. He is welcome hither. This is Decius Brutus. He is welcome to this Casca, this Cinna, and this Metellus Simber. They are all welcome. What watchful cares do interpose themselves betwixt your eyes and night? Shall I entreat a word? Here lies the east. Doth not the day break here? No. Oh, um, pardon, sir, it doth, and yon gray lines that fret the clouds are messengers of day. You shall confess that you are both deceived. Here, as I point my sword, the sun arises, which is a great way growing on the south, weighing the youthful season of the year. Some two months hence, up higher towards the north, he first presents his fire, and the high east stands as the capital, directly here. Give me your hands all over, one by one. And swear our resolution. No, not an oath. If not the face of men, the suffering of our souls, time's abuse, if these be motives weak, break off betimes, and every man make hence to his idle bed. So let high-sighted tyranny range on, till every man drop by lottery. But if these have, as I think they do, fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women. Then, countrymen, what need we any spur but our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not palter? And what other oath than honesty to honesty engaged, that this shall be, or we will fall for it? Swear priests and cowards and men caudalous, old feeble carrions and such suffering souls that welcome wrongs. Unto bad causes swear such creatures as men doubt. But do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the insuppressive metal of our spirits to think that, or our cause, or our performance did need an oath. When every drop of blood that every Roman bears, and nobly bears, is guilty of a several bastardy, if he do break the smallest particle of any promise that hath passed from him. But what of Cicero? Shall we sound him? I think he will stand very strong with us. Let us not leave him out. No, by no means. Oh, let us have him, for his silver hairs will purchase us a good opinion and by men's voices to commend our deeds. <laughs> it shall be said, his judgment ruled our hands. Our youths and wildness shall no whit appear, but all be buried in his gravity. Oh, name him not. Let us not break with him, for he will never follow anything that other men begin then leave him out. Indeed, he is not fit. Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Decius well urged. I think it is not meet that Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find of him a shrewd contriver, 
and you know his means, should he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all. Which to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs, like wrath in death and envy afterwards. For Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrificers, but not butchers. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of man there is no blood. Oh, that we could then come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar, but alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. Let's carve him as a dish fit for the gods, not hew him like a carcass for the hounds. And let our hearts, as subtle masters do, stir up their servants to an act of rage and after seem to chide them. Brutus, Cassius, Trebonius. This shall make our purpose necessary and not envious, which is so appearing to the common eyes, we shall be called perjurers, not murderers. And for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is cut off. And yet I fear him, for in the engrafted love he bears to Caesar, alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he loves Caesar, all that he can do is to himself take thought and die for Caesar. And that were much he should, for he is given to sports, to wildness, and much company. There is no fear in him. Let him not die, for he will live and laugh at this hereafter. Ding! 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 Peace! Count the clock! The clock hath stricken three. T Tis time to part. But it is doubtful yet whether Caesar will come forth today or no, for he is superstitious grown of late, quite from the main opinion he held once of fantasy, of dreams and ceremonies. It may be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terrors of this night, and the persuasion of his augurs may hold him from the capital today. <laughs> Never fear that. If he be so resolved, I can oversway him. For he loves to hear that unicorns may be betrayed with trees, and bears with glasses, elephants with holes, lions with toil, and men with flatterers. But when I tell him he hates flatterers, he says he does, being then most flattered. Let me work, for I can give his humor the true bend, and I will bring him to the capital. Nay, we will all of us be there to fetch him. By the eighth hour, is that the uttermost? Be that the uttermost, and fail not then. Caius Ligarius doth bear Caesar hard, who rated him for speaking well of Pompey. I wonder none of you have thought of him. Now, good Metellus, go along by him. He loves me well, and I have given him reasons. Send him but hither, and I'll fashion him. The morning comes upon us. We'll leave you, Brutus. And friends, disperse yourselves. But all remember what you have said and show yourselves true Romans. Good gentlemen, look fresh and merrily. Let not our looks put on our purposes, but bear it as our Roman actors do. With untired spirits and formal constancy, and so Good morrow to you, everyone. Lucius! Boy! Fast asleep. Tis no matter. Enjoy the honey-heavy dew of slumber. Thou hast no figures, no nor fantasies, which care draws upon the brains of men. Therefore thou sleepest so sound. Brutus, my lord! Portia! What mean you? Wherefore rise you now? 
It is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw cold of morning. Nor for yours neither. You ungently brute a stole from my bed, and yesterday night at supper you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across, and when I asked you what the matter was, you stared at me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, then you scratched your head, and too impatiently stamped with your foot. Yet I insisted, and yet you answered not, but with an angry wafture of your hand gave sign for me to leave you. So I did, fearing to strengthen that impatience, which seemed too much enkindled, and with all hoping it was but an effect of humor, which sometime hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep, and could it work so much upon your shape as it hath much prevailed on your condition? I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so I do. Good Portia, go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humors of the faint morning? What? Is Brutus sick, and will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night? And tempt the roomy end on turgid air to add unto the sickness? No. You do this. You have some sick offense within your mind, which, by the right and virtue of my place, I ought to know of, and upon my knees, I charm you by my once commended beauty, by all your vows of love, and by that great vow get incorporate and make us one that you unfold to me yourself your half why you are heavy and what men tonight have had to resort to you for here has been some six or seven who did hide their faces even from the darkness kneel not gentle Portia I should not need if you were gentle, Brutus, within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it accepted? I should know no secrets that according to you. Am I yourself, as it were, in sort or limitation, to keep with you at meals, to comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. You are my true and honorable wife, as dear to me as the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then I should know the secret. I grant I am a woman, but a woman that Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you, I am no stronger than my sex? Being so father and so husbanded? Tell me your counsels. I will not disclose them. I have made strong proof of my constancy, giving myself here a voluntary wound, here in the thigh. Can I bear that with patience and not my husband's secrets? Oh, ye gods, render me worthy of this noble wife. Hark, hark, one knocks. Portia, go in a while. And by and by thy bosom shall partake the secrets of my heart. All my engagements I will construe to thee, all the character of my sad brows. Leave me with haste. Lucius, who's that knocks? Oh, who's a sick man that would speak with you? Caius Ligarius, that Metellus spake of. Boy, stand aside. Caius Ligarius, how? Such safe good morrow from a feeble tongue. <coughs> oh, what a time of you chose out, brave Caius, to wear a kerchief. Would you were not sick? I am not sick. If Brutus have in hand any exploit worthy the name of honor. Such an exploit have I in hand, Ligarius. 
Had you a healthful ear to hear it? By all the gods that Romans bow before, I here discard my sickness. Soul of Rome, brave son, derived from honorable loins, thou, like an exorcist, hast conjured up my mortified spirit. Now bid me run, and I will strive with things impossible. Yea, get the better of them. What's to do? A piece of work that will make sick men whole. But are not some whole that we must make sick. That must we also. What it is, my Caius, I shall unfold to thee, as we are going to whom it must be done. Set on your foot, and with a heart new fired I follow you to do I know not what, but it sufficeth that Brutus leads me on. Follow me then.